Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's session. This session is building a right size system that serves young people effectively in places where those interventions will do the most good. I think we all know that more and more people are recognizing that many of our public systems, including the formal youth justice system, are failing to fulfill their missions. Every day, day after day, we see stories about scandals and critiques of the youth justice system. Uh, youth prisons are plagued by physical and sexual abuse, suicides, inappropriate use of isolation, pepper spray, shackles, and on and on and on, as well as just lousy results. Mason systems are too often just overwhelmed by caseloads that are jammed with young people who probably don't need any probation supervision at all, but are nevertheless on the probation uh, caseload. And that makes it awfully difficult to provide the kind of more individualized and intensive interventions for those young people with, with higher needs. So one response to these kinds of challenges is to figure out how do we partner more fully and more effectively with communities? How do we uh, discover and unlock literally the resources of communities and young people themselves and rely less on the public system to do everything. And sometimes this means providing uh, funding for contracts for community-based groups to provide services, but there are also people who say, no, there's much, many, many other functions that are currently played by the public system that could be more effectively played by uh, community-led organizations. So this, session is going to start with the basic question of how do we get better results and better outcomes for our young people and for our communities? What, what are the elements? What should you be looking for in effective interventions? And how do they fit with a partnership between formal systems and communities? Now, key to the, those questions are really getting clear on what are the roles that the public system ought to play, what are the functions the public system ought to carry, and what are the roles or functions that a community-led network of support and intervention might carry? And importantly, how do we figure out this complicated partnership between public systems and communities so they can work together on behalf of our, our young people? I want to introduce our two panelists today, uh, starting with Catherine Lucero, who is the director of the California Office of Youth and Community Restoration. This is a relatively new office charged with overseeing the transition of the state's entire youth justice system uh, from the old model, of the, the old youth prison model, the California Youth Authority, to county-run programs and supports for young people, which are supposed to reach deeply into community. Director Lucero actually began her career as a prosecutor and then served as the commissioner of the court for Santa Clara County. Uh, she became a superior court judge and then the supervising judge in the superior court of Santa Clara County and then was named as the uh, director of this new office. Over the course of her career, Catherine has developed really just an incredibly impressive number of very, very innovative strategies to make sure that young people are treated uh, with dignity and with respect, uh, that their families are involved and engaged and in a leadership role with their uh, young people, uh, and to help families and young people uh, both recognize and develop their strengths so they can build a better future for themselves. So we're very, very excited to have uh, Judge Lucero joining us in the session today. Clinton Lacey is currently the president and CEO of Credible, Credible Messengers 3. For six years, he was the director of the DC Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services, where he led and supported the development of the Credible Messenger model. Uh, he has also served in the past as a deputy commissioner of the New York City Department of Probation and Parole, and as a site manager for the Haywood Burns Institute. So Clint's career included both public system roles at the highest level and very deep community work, and is recognized as one of this country's leaders in reimagining the role of communities and reimagining the roles 
of the public system to get better outcomes for young people and their families. So we're gonna begin with some very brief summaries by Catherine, Catherine and Clint uh, of their respective organizations and what their roles are so we can kind of provide a context for the rest of the conversation. So we're gonna start with uh, Catherine. Thank you so much, uh, Patrick. Uh, I'll just, um, I'm Catherine Lucero. Uh, thank you for letting me speak to you today. Um, the Office of Youth and Community Restoration is all about this re-envisioning ju uh, juvenile justice through a health-based lens. Next slide. And um, just for some context, here's the latest report on juvenile justice arrests in California. You can see that there's been a huge decline even in the last five years uh, for referrals uh, and arrests. Next slide. This slide stands for um, probation referrals. Uh, still a lot of uh, referrals are being made for misdemeanors, not many for status offenses any longer. Uh, and then um, we have our felony referrals that have gone down uh, considerably since 2016. Um, next. And then a trend uh, for youth facing adult court in California, you can see from this grid, that in 2008, a combination of fitness hearings and direct file by the DA was about a 1,200 cases that year went over to adult court. And last year, uh, there were about uh, 28 cases. Um, we'll get our post-pandemic number soon, but even pre-pandemic, we were at 65. So uh, uh, through a series of reform, there's been a, a huge drastic decline in youth who are tried in adult court in California. Next. And then um, disparities continue, however, uh, as they do across the nation with regard to the over uh, arrests, uh, surveillance and incarceration of youth of color. Next. Next. Uh, AB, excuse me, SB 823 uh, was signed in July of 2020. Uh, in a few days, uh, DJJ, which is our statewide carceral settings for youth prisons, will close forever and for good. Today, there are 10 kids there. Nine of them will be transitioned today. One will stay till Wednesday. So we'll, we'll be able to actually close out our statewide youth prison system by the end of the week. And my office is uh, was created within the California Health and Human Services Division, and uh, specifically to look at uh, leadership for statewide um, health-oriented evidence-based trauma-informed um, programming for our youth who uh, commit law violations. Next. Here's our timeline. We started out, um, I was hired um, in uh, January of 2022. Um, in the place of the youth prisons that are closing, 36 secure youth treatment facilities have popped up in our 58 counties. I have visited all of them. And uh, we also have an ombuds uh, hotline, which we are uh, fielding uh, calls and complaints from youth, family, and even staff from probation that we are beginning to, to find themes and beginning to address. Next. Some of our projects are ending the incarceration of girls and gender expansive youth. We are at this time funding four counties to do that. We're looking at developing a system of care for our youth who are involved in the justice system, including less restrictive programs and alternatives to incarceration. And then a really, really big focus on higher education and career. Next. We've had some good um, wins so far. Um, next. And then we're just, you know, the opportunity of this moment cannot be understated. Um, I think that was my last slide. Next. Yeah. I, I did I did want to just say the opportunity of this moment cannot be understated uh, or overstated, excuse me, um, because um, 
we are we've closed uh, you know a system. We are looking at opening a a, a a new era of youth justice with a very heavy focus on adolescent brain development and looking at research and data and science to drive how we intervene in what I call a developmentally appropriate intervention for youth who are court involved. So I'll I'll kick it to Lise, to Clinton. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to uh, share the this time with you, Judge, or now Director Lucero, a little follow of your work. And um, it's an honor to be present with all, all here today to have this conversation. Uh, as Patrick said, I'm the uh, President and CEO of the Credible Messenger Mentoring Movement. We call it CM3 for short. Um, and I think the context for that work um, really goes back, um, well, it goes back to uh, into history in terms of just this ongoing um, effort to reimagine and recreate um, a process and a practice of justice that really empowers communities, um, as opposed to the you know historic and to a great extent still ongoing um, harm that continues to take place in some of the ways that was just described in the PowerPoint. Um, I became deputy commissioner of the New York City Probation Department in 2011 uh, under Benny Shiradi, who was then commissioner. And um, as a person who had never been a probation officer and had never worked inside of government um, or within law enforcement, um, and one who had had a background in working with youth at Rikers Island and the Burn and working at the Burns Institute, et cetera, at direct service and uh, advocacy, um, uh, it was an interesting and, and intentional on the part of Benny who put together a team of folks, um, some with system experience and many others who brought a community uh, perspective to the table. And we embarked on a process that really I frame as reintroducing ourselves to the communities that we served, um, where there was historic and, and current really um, deeply antagonistic and challenging relationships between the system um, and the community, um, probation being part of that. And so our reintroduction was really about, I think, trying to shift the conversation and shift the paradigm to create a culture and a practice and a body of work that was really intentional about uh, community empowerment, about really helping to empower people on probation uh, and their families and the communities that they represented um, to help turn probation, uh, continue to turn probation into a place that was um, not a place just to monitor compliance, right? Um, or to enforce law, but really to serve as a barrier to any further penetration into the system. And our, our thinking about that, the array of, of the array of ideas really was centered on um, doing no harm or doing less harm and really using ourselves um, to invest and facilitate a process of healing, growth, um, empowerment on the part of those 25 people on probation, 25,000 people on probation, but um, their, their communities. And I share that experience because of that we had initiated a couple of um, initiatives that I think are very relevant to the work that we're doing now at CM3. One was called NEONS, where we really went into the community and reached out to engage community members to help define or redefine um, what the probation experience could look like. Um, and really centering on uh, activities and resources and services and opportunities for people uh, beyond the, the the very narrow compliance focus of, of probation at, at the time to expand it to really trying to use ourselves as uh, facilitators and investors and to add value to communities um, and those who were impacted by the justice system. Uh, the other signature initiative was called Arches Transformative Mentoring which is now commonly referred to as um, one of the um, key uh, aspects or forms of credible messenger work. And we invested in 20 communities, uh, put 20 grants, I should say, in seven major communities in New York City, which led the, the, the top of the list of incarceration and um, people on probation and violations of probation. Um, of crime, of violence, et cetera, right? These were the target neighborhoods. And we invested in those local neighborhoods and people, particularly those who had been 
most impacted and also marginalized, um, impacted by the justice system directly and indirectly, and otherwise marginalized in, those co in their communities. We knew within that population of folks in these challenged neighborhoods were leaders, was great expertise, was great experience, um, was the opportunity to leverage those experiences, those perspectives, those relationships, that body of expertise to really add value to um, serve our 16 to 24 year olds on probation for sure, but also to begin to shift, right? The relationship between system and the justice system and the community. And I share those experiences because I, as I left New York and became the director in DC, we expanded the initiative to serve not just young people committed by the court, but their families as well. But we also infused credible messengers, right? Community rooted folks into our detention center and our post disposition uh, facility, New Beginnings, and also into the workings of our day-to-day -day operations in the community as well. So this infusion of credible messenger presence and participation for us and for me is representative of a larger idea really that was talked about I think at the beginning of our conversation and been talked about today. Um, it's an infusion of community perspective, a community experience, which begins to change the conversation. It changes the reform conversation, the reform agenda, and opens us up to a greater transformation, uh, which has huge implications. So uh, with that body of work in New York and DC, ultimately in 2021, I resigned and we created Credible Messenger Mentoring Movement, CM3, as an organization that would serve and support uh, the advancement of credible messenger work around the country, working with uh, uh, community-based organizations, with probation departments, with other system partners, all with the idea of advancing the opportunity for people uh, closest to the problem, rooted in the communities that we're all concerned about, which serve as the sources of, of people who are in detention, um, who are in placement, who are in the justice system, system, investing in those communities, investing in those people, perhaps those least likely, um, perhaps those who have by and large been left out of the conversation, if not blamed for the problem, knowing that within that community, there is great value, great expertise, um, great experience and great impact that can be had uh, on young people in the justice system, for sure in a transformative way, which we could talk about as we go forward in terms of what young people need who are in the justice system. But that credible messengers slash community representatives can also have an impact on systems, on system culture, uh, policy practice, which ultimately I believe has to come together, right? This question of systems and community, what does that collaboration look like? And that's what we hope to talk about more as we go forward with the conversation. So really happy to be here to talk about CM3's work, but to talk about this larger idea of, um, of a shift on the current level of investment and reliance on systems to a greater investment and reliance on a wealth of knowledge, experience, uh, care, support um, that is brought from the community. Terrific. Thanks, Clinton. Thanks, uh, thanks, Catherine. I'm going to be posing a series of questions to our panelists, but we'll follow the conversation wherever it goes. I always think it's really important to get clear on what you're trying to accomplish. Like, what's what's the result you're trying to achieve? What are the outcomes we should be looking at? So, I'm going to ask uh, both of our panelists to share their thoughts on what are the most important outcomes for young people themselves, and what are the most important outcomes for communities that the formal public system ought to be pursuing. Uh, I'll start with Catherine and Clint will come to you. Um, thank you, um, Patrick. So I think the most important outcomes that we're looking for at OICR for our, our youth um, are a sense of um, self-determination, a sense of uh, moving past the moment that uh, we find each other in, because, um, you know, as a judge, I often would never have met these young people unless I found them in my courtroom. 
But what was important to me and is important to me as a leader um, in this work is to recognize that, in fact, in front of me is a is a kid, is a youth. And what I can offer them through this work is to treat them as such, as a human going through a developmental phase, which through research tells us there's an age crime curve and you know there's behavior that happens at a certain age and tapers off at a certain age. And adolescence itself is a phase of human development that is really being offered to um, only some kids, black, brown, and Native American kids um, in the United States uh, often don't have the privilege of, of adolescence and adolescent mistakes. Um, so what I think we the best we can offer our youth that we meet in, and um, end up in our systems is a chance at that. And recently someone indicated to me that it's really often not a second chance, it's a first chance. Um, if a youth is um, involved in a juvenile justice system in California, that means they're at least 12, because 11 and under does not, unless there's very few exceptions, does not enter into our system. Um, so, and, and the youth that are, um, are being realigned to the counties have had to commit their offense at 14, 15, 16, or 17. Those are kids. Those are students. Those are students. The job of a youth is to learn. Um, and so how can I be 100% supportive of get, making sure that that youth has access to realize what their hopes and dreams are? after um, the appropriate accountability, the appropriate intervention uh, that we can um, also look to the fact that the youth are um, highly traumatized on the ACEs, um, uh, you know, the ACEs assessment four or more, uh, according to one research um, article out of Florida, um, but I would say in my years on the bench, my 22 years on the bench, I mean, I I did not ever uh, see an untraumatized um, kid. Um, so um, so what can we offer? We can offer um, to intervene in a developmentally appropriate way, treating youth as youth who have made a mistake, sometimes a really um, bad mistake, but a mistake nevertheless. And how can we wrap around that youth to support them moving through that in a way that is healing and in a way that they feel welcomed back into their communities, connected to their families, whatever that family is. Um, and, and by the way, that leads to community safety, a youth feeling connected, feeling loved, feeling welcomed, feeling forgiven leads to community safety. So everybody wins with this type of intervention. There are no studies that say the longer you incarcerate, the more safe a community is. There are no studies that say that. It is the opposite. The more compassion we can have for that youth who's going through adolescent development, the more love we can surround that youth with, the more family we can engage, the more people we can bring in to love that youth, that's how we, that's how we win. Thank you, uh, Catherine Clinton. Yeah, I, I totally agree and just want to echo all that was just said in terms of everything really and um, just happened to have the pleasure of doing a panel with the sentencing project with uh, Dick Mendel and he was sharing some of the com compelling, compelling data with regards to uh, the, the, the harms and the outcomes of incarceration with young people as opposed to it, um, as, as was just shared, it um, uh, impacting positively uh public safety you know the opposite is certainly true um that we what remains are some serious questions and opportunities then what, the, what works um what is it that our most troubled young people um and families need uh to reverse cycles um to promote wellness with them and their families and their communities i think we're striving for and we have a vision for uh something that liz ryan said I, maybe i counted about 10 times today in her in her uh, talk, uh, safe space, safe spaces for our young people and our families, um, be they 
uh, physical safe spaces, of course, right? Um, emotional safe spaces, cultural safe spaces, um, ideally at home in their communities. Um, so how do we help create um, wellness and safety and peace in communities? A large conversation, of course, um, but with really promising and compelling answers, uh, much of which are coming from the community themselves, incredible messengers themselves, et cetera. Um, so whether a young person is uh, where we want them to be, home and in community, whole and supported, uh, wrapped around with, with love and care um, and opportunity, even in those uh, circumstances where they are inside of our carceral settings, where, where we don't want them, but even when that is the case, inside of detention, et cetera, how do we create safe space for them there to the best that we can, right? There's answers to that. Infusion of community, infusion of credible messengers. Um, so it's about creating a opportunity for healing um, where young people and families can begin to reimagine themselves and their possibilities um, given their environment, given their ecosystem, um, where restoration can take place. Um, progress, right? Um, expansion and, and pursuit of, of possibilities. I mean, that's what we want. Um, you know, I started to say that the, the work that we did at probation in New York it, through Arches, transformative mentoring with credible messengers, it resulted in a 60% uh, reduction in recidivism, um, which is amazing, which was unprecedented numbers founded by the Urban Institute. But our vision is not just for reduced recidivism, right? It's critical. We want our young people outside. We, we don't want them in institutions. But we have greater vision, of course. And we believe that uh, a, a justice system uh, properly uh, connected and supportive of community options can begin to promote, to a far greater extent, healing, uh, reimagination, restoration, progress, um, and, and success. Um, so I think those are the, the key key things that we want for our young people, for our communities and our, and our families um, is, is, is increased capacity, right? Um, the village that it takes to raise our children needs an infusion of resources, of opportunities, of capacity. And I think a lot of the work that we're doing is, 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 is seeking to build that, uh, recognizes that the answer is ultimately in the community. And so vision, whole, um, involved, um, engaged, and resourced communities, community-based organizations, formal and informal institutions, youth and families. I mean, I think this is the goal, ultimately, of, of, of a healthy uh, justice system, not to create and build a, a greater system apparatus. Um, the system has its role to play, and I'm sure we'll get into that uh, and unpack that some but to really focus on the, the, the development and the capacitation of our villages, of our, of our neighborhoods, um, where our young people ultimately will live. Yeah, there's just uh, so much depth in what each of you had to say. Um, this is an overly glib summary, but what I, what I heard, if I was gonna break it down to just a couple headlines from each of you is that of a young person, gets involved in some way with the system, they ought to, at the end of the day, be less likely in the future to harm someone and more likely to be on a path towards positive development and success. And the communities in which they live ought to be much more likely to be places that support and have the resources to support families and young people to achieve their full potential. And if we're not being successful on all three of those, uh, then we're not a successful, we don't have a successful approach to youth justice. Um, I, um, I think Clint sort of pointed us to the next phase of this conversation, which uh, Clint, I believe you said something to the effect that, uh, you know, it's, it's will be important to unpack this question of, so what's the role of the public system what does the public system hang on to and what does it let go of? And what do community led and community grounded organizations take on uh, in order to be a, a more effective response to uh, youth uh, uh, who harm someone 
uh, who, who harm the community. Right. So um, why don't we start to un un unpack that? I'm, I'm just going to frame it as there are, you know, an increasing number of voices who essentially say the public system is so flawed that it really ought to uh, be completely shut down. Uh, that probation, uh, incarceration, um, uh, services, et cetera, should not be the province of a public bureaucracy, but should be uh, completely allocated to the community. Now that's on one side of the continuum. Uh, and then all the way on the other side of the continuum is, well, you know, the public systems are getting a little better at working with community and they're moving a little more money into services in the community and it's a process and we're moving along. Um, we're, you know, we kind of moving along for decades now. Uh, and then all the way in between. Um, so I just want to want to open it. I mean, uh, Clint, you've you've served in the role as a public system leader. Uh, you're now involved in uh, doing exactly what you're talking about, which is increasing the capacity of communities to have community led interventions, but also um, have community impacting the system. Uh, rather than just the other way around where the system impacts the community. So I want to start with you and then uh, turn it over to Catherine. Catherine's in an earlier stage. Um, California's in an earlier stage of the process here. But Clint, could you uh, help us unpack some of this system role versus community role? Sure. Yeah. And thank you for the, and I appreciate the way you framed it, you know, um, sort of a perhaps one might say tinkering at the edges, which is not to minimize the difficulty, right? And the hard work of trying to achieve change and reform and policy, right? So I don't mean to, to speak of it as frivolous, but just in terms of vision and the limited time and urgency, you know, I do think of it as perhaps tinkering versus a more massive shift um, in the paradigm to community-centered approaches. You know, one parenthetically, one thing I'll just throw out there, maybe to further complicate things a bit, it does raise for me questions around the idea of governance, though, right? So shift to community, but what is governance? What is the administrative um, um, arm of that? What does that look like? What role does government play? I think that uh, the system uh, can, and and certainly at this phase, right, before we reach maybe that greater vision um shift its identity actually i think it's a in one way a question of a, a different identity on the part of systems and system leaders um from uh the traditional perspective or identity of of systems we are the place we are the people we are the apparatus that has to get this done right we have to protect public safety we have to rehabilitate we have to um supervise etc um and so there's been, you know, even in the reform era, a good, a great amount of energy um, and funding um, and work towards creating a better machine, a healthier, kinder, gentler, more humane, sensible um, machine, which of course has resulted in, I think, a better experience for, for young people, right? In many ways, of course, you know, uh, JDAI and other efforts like that had, had major impact. But part of that work has also been about this larger question about community. And so this shift of identity is from, we are the people in the place and the apparatus, and that's our greatest value to this issue, to we are more valuable as investors and facilitators, and perhaps administrators of a process that is drastically uh, shifted to um, the infusion of resources and the capacity building of community-based actors and programs um, and approaches. So, so I absolutely think there needs to be a, a fundamental shift to a greater reliance on community alternatives to incarceration, uh, community-based programs that keep kids out of system, um, that get them out of carceral settings, that you know ultimately. Um, put them on a trajectory where they're no longer under city or county or state supervision, et cetera. Um, and the system can do something to facilitate that, right? Um, if it can let go of its sense of power and responsibility, and ultimately, I think, um, notion that the community is incapable or um, not the appropriate place and people to be doing this work. Um, 
So I always say, you know, we talk about the village. Um, I've never heard it said it takes a it takes a probation department to raise a child, right? <laughs> you know, it takes a takes a police department to raise a child, right? We we've agreed it takes a village. So I think this shift to unpack this question of system role is to um, utilize system knowledge, um, capacity, um, finances, right, and, and invest that to a far greater extent. Um, into and in community. Now, this has huge implications, of course, right? Um, you know, close close down a probation department with three thousand employees, right, and create a continuum of care and support with a vast, a great, a increased amount of community-based organizations. What happens to those employees, right? This is huge. We know this with in terms of unions, um, positions that categorically, generally are opposed to these things, people are concerned about their jobs, et cetera. So I don't mean to make this sound simple or frivolous, but um, this is what we have to contend with, right? A real shift in, in investment. Um, and I think that this investment, I often think of it, and I'll close here on this particular question, um, in terms of the scale of this shift, I often draw an analogy, perhaps, hopefully it, it works, of, of a new deal. Like we need a new deal in our communities. We need massive, right? And I'm, even within the question of justice, the administration of justice, a pretty drastic uh, shift of resources and investment in community-based options. The last thing I would say, and then I promise to close here, is that beyond the rhetoric, you mentioned the rhetoric. And so, so much of what I'm saying perhaps sounds just rhetorical, but we're actually demonstrating on the ground the substance of that shift. Right, young people did 60% better in New York on probation, while the front line of engagement wasn't probation officers; it was credible messengers. Right, so community actors and programs um, and people engaging uh, the young people in question are demonstrating the shift, and with greater resources, we believe can have even greater impact. Again, lots to un unpack there. Clint, but I'm going to ask Catherine to weigh in on this question, what the role of the public system ought to be going forward and what the role of the community uh, ought to be. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm in the California Health and Human Services Department. I am not in the correctional department, um, which is a strong message coming out of California about um, public intervention, uh, public intervention with a lens of health rather than corrections. Um, there are many public systems that touch families, children, and youth. It's not just probation. It's not just a court. Currently, um, they all work in silos. Uh, I think we need a government um, design, which is centered around our community so that when the community sees um, our, our governmental systems working together, they feel valued. Instead of our uh, government uh, defaulting into what I call the convenience of, of, of a government agency. And when people see a government agency that works in a default towards that government agency, then people don't feel valued. Because if all I'm trying to do is uphold a system that doesn't really even meet the needs of a community, then of course that community is never gonna feel valued. So how can we move our systems into a, a, a design, a government design that says we value people? So it's a person-centered de design for things like educational institutions, high quality, safe educational institutions in every neighborhood affordable higher education and vocational training, housing departments that offer affordable housing, safe housing. I've always thought every child should have a right to a pillow, should have a right to a bed. Um, that's, that, that can be something that is a, a, a good outcome. Justice is, um, in, comes in many forms. It's not just a judge and a jail. Justice looks like high quality education, high quality housing, child care assistance, mental health interventions, 
drug and alcohol interventions, medical health, clean water, transportation, social services. So how can we begin to take what is working? Um, and we have a lot of really great programs coming out of CHHS. Um, but how do we begin to place our juvenile justice into that agenda? How do we begin to have some sort of sense that every child serving agency also serves this child? That one day when I'm in court and I'm a foster, I'm in a foster care court where we protect children, and the next day I'm in the judge in a juvenile justice court where we're prosecuting children. How can our system see that child as the same child and offer that, that sense of justice in the form of real help for real people? So, um, so I see this as a silo problem. I see this as um, designing our systems to um, offer real help to real people and to look at partnering with communities to fortify families to make families, to help families be stronger and to fortify the healing of culture, the medicine, the real medicine is the family and the culture and the spirit. Um, and that is what gets us to a healthy society. I don't, I don't want to opine on, you know, defunding anything as much as looking at organizational structures that actually work together to meet the needs of a person in, in our society. And this is a one by one. This is not, there's no, there's no like magic answer. There's no silver bullet. This is a one by one. And in California, in our juvenile justice system, less than 2% are the kids that were, that were in the youth prison. So we have about 700 kids and one by one, if we can look at them and give them what they need, I think we're going a, a, a very long way towards that healing and towards that health lens. I'm uh, terrific. And uh, go ahead, Clint. But just quickly, a thought as I was listening um, with regards to getting so even this fractured array of institutions of care, right? So when we enter, so by the time people reach the justice system, many times they have been failed by or fallen through the cracks of a host of other institutions of care, education, health, right? And other uh, housing. You know, we we know the complexity of it. So so justice is the door that we're entering through. That's the context where we're discussing this issue. As was said, there's this full array. I, I, it reminds me, I, uh, a few months ago, I, I moderated a, um, a, a, a um, session that brought together government actors um, and philanthropy. And it was decided that community wouldn't be in the room. They were like, well, we'll, we'll talk, we'll get community in here, but first we got to get our heads together, right? philanthropy and government to figure out how to how to work. And, you know, my thought was, and it, it was a great session and it, it was helpful. Uh, um, the folks obviously had a lot of great things to say, but my thought was the actual thing that's going to bring government and philanthropy together is the community, right? So what's going to bring together this these fractured um, institutions of care, right? Or even within the justice system itself, right? These semi-autonomous institutions that comprise the justice system. What's gonna to bring together like a more coherent vision and approach um, isn't gonna be like theory and training. It's gonna be the community inside of the machine, in the mix, in the way, sort of clogging up and um, um, engaging in such a way that, that, that does slow and change processes. So in DC, we infuse credible messengers at, at, at the table with case managers, with program directors, with decisions that were being made on a case level, but also on a programmatic and on a policy level. Well, that, and maybe I'm jumping ahead, but that proved to be messy at times, painful at times, difficult for sure, but um, a more authentic way of bringing about a system culture change. It was the presence and the involvement and the participation of the community, of families, of young people, of grandmothers, of community-based organizations that began to bring about that uh, system culture policy change, um, and which I think is also more sustainable once you have that level of participation. So anyway, I, I just wanted to share that. 
thanks, Clint. And, and I'm not going to even try to summarize, you know, the, the last 10 minutes of the conversation, but I do have an observation, uh, both from a number of comments in the chat that I've been trying to keep up with, uh, as well as what Catherine had to say and what Clinton had to say. And that is that th there's a, a depressing way in which the youth justice system has become the, uh, if not the default, at least the consolation prize um, for not investing in the basics uh, that communities need in order for them to support families and, and young people. In other words, rather than invest in communities, rather than invest in things like employment opportunity and entrepreneurship and uh, investing of the, in the dreams of uh, young people and their families, uh, we use the youth justice and as well the, the having the other um, uh, systems of care do a more effective job, whether it be child welfare, mental health, education, et cetera. The youth justice system sort of becomes the, the, the last uh, step, right? Um, because we're not investing in these, in these other things. So this whole conversation about the system role and the community role really has to start with not just the youth justice system, but all of us collectively, the public sector, of course, being a key player. Um, anyway, uh, uh, forgive the rambling observation, but it just occurs to me that a theme that I've seen a lot in the chat and I heard in uh, Catherine's comments and Clint, Clint's comments brought me to that uh, brought me to that uh, observation. Um, let's turn to an, an even more challenging topic, perhaps, but. Um, Again, in the several uh, uh, chat entries, as well as in this conversation, it's clear that, uh, especially in communities that have been greatly impacted by public systems, uh, there's not a whole lot of reason for trust uh, with formal systems. Um, we collectively uh, have too often said to community, you know, I'm from government and I'm here to help. Let's sit down and talk about things and then things don't change or often get worse. So um, from the standpoint of now the youth justice system, how do you build a relationship? How do you build a partnership with true community, true community leaders, uh, given the history? And how do you build that trust over time? Uh, and how do you sustain an effective, uh, an effective partnership? And uh, Catherine, again, I know you're in early stages. I'm going to ask you just to bring us up to date, if you will, on on what um, California is trying to do. And, and I know it's early, early days. And then Clinton ask you to um, reflect on that question as well. So how do you build partnerships, um, Catherine? Well, um, you know, I, I often say that as long as people keep coming to the table, we have half a chance at making a difference. So very delicately, <laughs> we build relationships and a, a lot of it is time. It's investing time, uh, regularity. Um, you know, we, we at um, my office are meeting, gosh, you know, way too many meetings probably, but it's with really valuable um, key folks, um, both from community and from tribes, and from government. Um, at this point, I can honestly tell you, Patrick, that I think everybody is trying to figure out who we are and how we impact, right? Like, why are we here? We've never been, this is brand new. We had no protocols, no policies and procedures. I had to hire, you know, people. I was the second person hired for a 30 person office. So, um, so it's, it's, it's outreach. It's um, follow through. Um, I know that when I was in the courts, uh, we met regularly. And one of the things that's valuable to me is getting people of diverse backgrounds and diverse thinking in the same room so that we could brainstorm and find that common value. And you can find a common value, like people that have very distinct coming at things from different ways, you can find a vision and a mission because this is about you and this is about families. And actually everybody wants 
a better outcome and to do less harm. It's just how you get there that is the difference. And so building that trust, and I, I'm a year and a half into this, um, has been uh, by being, you know, regularly meeting, uh, following through, not over promising, um, seeing people in person where they live, going to communities, to community centers, inviting families, inviting youth. Um, so, um, so this is it's this is this is the work, right? This is human work. The work of of seeing people, of seeing their values, of seeing them in their communities, of um, seeking to understand, and and not not saying much. To be honest, Patrick, listening, listening a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, I think the jury's still out on our success because we are still so new. But what I can tell you is that we have very strong, diametrically different opinions, uh, people still meeting regularly and having these hard conversations and 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 getting uh, through this complex, layered and nuanced work uh, on behalf of our youth. So that's what I can share today. Thank you, Catherine. Clinton? Yeah, thank you. I love what, what Catherine said and agree so much with like really emphasizing the listening, the active, intentional, um, structured, right? Formal, informal listening, um, I think is, is underrated, but really huge and building trust. The outreach piece, um, you know, at probation, when we started uh, to reach out, like this was a time in the city with, that stop and frisk was still happening, right? In New York City, there was a huge, you know, um, a gap and, and a great antagonism and lack of trust. And um, one of the things that, that we talked about um, was that we, we were moving from the punitive doing two people and moving from the sort of paternalistic doing four people, but that we were going to do with people, right? And so that's sort of a, a nice sounding phraseology, but like, how do you actually put that into practice? And I think Catherine is speaking to that. Um, sharing data. You know, one of the things that we noticed was that we, as, as system leaders, we share more data at conferences, right, than we do in communities often, mm -hmm. right? Um, so how do we share inf information, transparency, and understanding the complexity of confidentiality? But there's a great amount of data and information that can be shared with community, which I think goes a long way, um, as opposed to being defensive. Um, Finding ways to share decision making, We're, you know, that's that that's a vast area to explore. You know, some of the things that are just sort of counterintuitive on the part of systems, they might be spaces, lower hanging fruit, even where why can't the uh, community based uh, com com committees and advisory groups make decisions about some of the things. These were the things that we started doing it at probation as well as in in D.C. Um, real role and responsibility clarification when you're trying to actually engage in a substantive partnership, right? Um, a great amount of fear, a great amount of bias on, on both sides often, community and system. So literally putting people in rooms together, right? Retreats, like things of that nature where you can really begin to have the painful, difficult conversations. You know, one of the things that we started out by doing was apologizing to communities, like, you know, for, for past harms, for a culture that was harmful, right? And, and being transparent about that, but being proactive. The last thing I would share is even with regards to a, 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 an opportunity to um, solicit services from community, right? RFP, et cetera. Uh, with, and, and what we began in New York City was to kind of break out of the traditional process and we did huge amount, as Catherine said, of outreach to reach grassroots organizations, to, re to reach uh, communities who often weren't in the circles, in the know, right? Or with the capacity to even participate in relationships with the system, right? There's a certain amount of capacity that's required. But we wanted to reach people who, who didn't have that capacity to begin to widen the circle of participation um, 
to really shift, uh, I think, and, and, and through our rhetoric, yes, but also through our practices um, and through creating spaces and opportunities to shift from community as hopeful recipients of fair and equitable you know, justice to participants in defining, right? Um, what that looks like and fashioning what policy and program looks like, right? And so that's just a, a, a different approach. Um, um, and it can, it can be or sound overwhelming or impossible, but um, it's an approach that has to begin somewhere with a first step, a second step, and, and, and it grows and reputation and trust really develops through these types of engagements. That's absolutely been my experience um, and others when you really reach out to community with authenticity um, and transparency. I think it's, I think it's a very promising um, approach that we need more of. Well, thank you both for those comments. We are just about at the end of our time. And I'm gonna, just gonna ask each of you, beginning with Catherine and then Clint, just to share uh, in a minute or two, uh, if there's any important points that you really wanted to make, and I didn't ask the right question, or any concluding comments you might have. Uh, this, this session could go on for another hour and I'd still be asking lots of questions, but I'm gonna ask you, Catherine, to lead us off with any points that you wanted to make sure uh, you emphasized uh, or any concluding remarks, and then I'll ask Clinton to do the same. Um, Father Gregory Boyle uh, of um, out of LA, Homeboy Industries, um, quotes Mother Teresa as saying that the real problem with our society is that we have forgotten that we belong to each other. Mm. And it's my hope that we can remember that we belong to each other and that every child um, deserves to be parented by all of us. And a community that is healed is a community that steps up and feels that responsibility for every child, for every kind of child, no matter what they've done or where they're from. And so that's what I hope to, um, to generate with this um, leadership in California to, for all of us to remember that we belong to each other. Thank you for letting me uh, share today. Thank you so much, Catherine. And, you know, really, we're all watching California and wishing you the best of luck. I mean, you don't need our luck, but you have all our support for what it is you're trying to accomplish. It's, uh, you know, it's gonna change how we think about youth justice across the entire country. It's just great work. So we're, we're really happy you're at the helm uh, guiding the state through this complicated process. So thank you, thank you. Uh, Clint, your turn. Yes, I would just say that, you know, there's such vast um, need for engagement, for service, of, for support, for love, for the wraparound, the investment that our communities need. And I, we all know that. And I just wanted to say with regards to the system community conversation, right? I mean, systems and agencies are made up of people, right? Um, and certainly there's folks who work in systems who need to be in another industry, right? Who aren't, who, who aren't well intended, but I think Overwhelmingly, there's there's people inside of places who are inside of cultures, um, who have practices, who who are who perhaps are we disagree on approaches. But I think our conversation really needs to also include um, a, a, a reimagination, retraining, uh, a redistribution of people, not a displacement of people, not a blaming of people, right? Um, I can talk for hours about the harms of the system, but I think our conversation needs to get to, um, in a reimagined uh, society, a reimagined system, um, how can we leverage human resources, leverage people who are here to help, to do well by people and well by the community, and, and start to have that conversation as we look forward towards a vision of a, of a, new, a new experience on the part of communities that are impacted by systems. Um, and, and, and that obviously uh, not just has a better relationship between the quote unquote system and the community, but begins to, to fuse those resources in such a way that creates something um, um, sustainable 
uh, that really empowers our young people and our families. But I just want well, to- Thanks. Thanks so much, Clinton and Catherine. I just got a message. They're about to close us down. So uh, I didn't want to miss the opportunity to thank everyone. And we're now going to go back into the main uh, the main session. Thanks.